Good morning. Um, my name is Rosita Stevens Holsey, and I think in my um, 80s, I'm becoming known as the niece of Reverend Dr. Pauli Murray. I hope some of you um, have heard about her. I'd just like to give you a sort of a backstory to um, why I'm here. Uh, I w had the pleasure of meeting Reverend Terry at the Virginia Theological Seminary, um, and she invited me to come to Brooks School. At the time, I didn't know that Brooks School was in Massachusetts, but I'm thrilled. Unfortunately, it's snowing, and I won't have time to go to my birthplace, but I was actually born near Springfield at Fort Devens um, Army Base. I was there because my father was in an all-black uh, brigade that had been put together to uh, fight in World War II. And so I lived there for the first few years of my life. One of my proud distinctions is I was actually the first black baby that they allowed to be born in the hospital. Uh, some of you young people may not know that um, years ago during my mother's and my grandmother's time, uh, black and brown people uh, had many more restrictions on their life than they did now. We couldn't go to the same schools. We had to ride in the back of the bus. We often could not eat in uh, restaurants. I'm sure some of you have uh, learned that there were even separate water fountains that said white and black. So oftentimes black people would die because a hospital where they had to go to and where they would be treated was not near where they were. So I'm very proud that by 1942, uh, in the month of March, uh, I was, uh, my mother was allowed to give birth to me at uh, Fort Devens Air, Massachusetts. Um, my aunt, Reverend Dr. Pauli Murray, some of you may know, um, is a saint in the Episcopal Church. But I knew her just as my aunt. She was a very humble person. She never uh, was interested in money or fame or being in charge. So my life actually intersected hers for 43 years. Though uh, we were very close and I was definitely inspired by her bravery, her for, right, um, her ability to speak up about anything that she felt was a problem, her interest in human beings, not just men or women or people of different races and culture, but all of them. She just looked at people as human bring, beings, and that's what she fought for. Uh, she was one of the people that was involved with the NAACP and Reverend Dr. Um, Martin Luther King. And she worked with them uh, through the NAACP and other organizations for many years. But when uh, Dr. King was organizing uh, the March on Washington in 1963, um, Pauli became a little disillusioned because Rosa Parks at that time was determined and called the godmother of civil rights because of her refusal to uh, get up uh, on the bus and give the bu uh, her seat to a white person. But Dr. King, um, being a male, uh, and uh, that was really the, the times that they lived in, uh, women were not thought to be as important as men in terms of where they worked or being in charge of anything. Um, and so Rosa Parks was not allowed to work with the male civil rights uh, leaders in the march. She was relegated to stay with the wives 
And uh, Aunt Polly thought that Martin Luther King should have some of the women who were involved in the uh, movement uh, up front with the men and able to say something. But basically, uh, he just allowed Mahalia Jackson to uh, sing. Uh, times were very different then, and women, black and brown people, and uh, LGBTQ persons had very few rights. But Aunt Polly's work um, with her legal theories have helped uh, change some of those laws, and I'm very proud of that. I'd just like to share before I leave um, what I call my Polly Murray epiphany. Um, I had found out that um, the Episcopal Church had honored her for her work uh, as a priest, as the first African-American female priest in the uh, entire Episcopal Church, and her work uh, in civil rights and human rights and women's rights. So um, after that, uh, family members would say to me, uh, have you heard that um, there's something going on about Polly Murray in North Carolina? Well, most of us had never been contacted as relatives uh, about that. So my niece decided that she would take me to Durham to find out just what it was that was going on because we kept meeting people who would mention that. When we got to Durham, um, it happened to be in July, and um, we were told that there was a um, service at Titus Episcopal Church, and they thought that I should, um, that we should go there. And so we took a, a taxi and we went over to the church, and uh, it was their feast day, and the entire service was in honor of her, and a uh, Bishop and other important dignitaries had come to speak about her. Um, I had, I, w I was just really spellbound during the entire um, service. I was um, so proud and so puzzled that all of this was going on and everyone seemed to uh, honor her and uh, the family really didn't know much about it. So after uh, the service was over, they had a, their normal ice cream uh, social. And uh, for about a half an hour, they said, um, and then we'll close. An hour and a half later, I'm still standing with a long line of people waiting to speak to me. There were people there who had actually met her, who wanted to share uh, the information with me and just tell me how much uh, she had meant to them or some funny little anecdote that uh, had happened in talking with her. And then there were people there who had never met her, but who had read about her either through the Episcopal Church or some of the many books which now have been written about her, and there were people there who didn't know anything about her, but after the hour-long service were very inspired. And people came up to me and just wanted to touch me because I carried the family blood that she had. So I felt myself having an out-of-body experience. And on the way back to the hotel, I said to my niece, all these people are honoring her, but what are we doing as the family? And I said, we have to do something. What, what you know, how can we do something? So we, um, the next day we were going to the Pauli Murray Center, which was a project of Duke University, which they had started in 2009. So after seeing our ancestral home, which I knew nothing about and had never been to, uh, the Fitzgeralds are my mother's family of Durham, very well known uh, because they were bricklayers and they built a lot of the government buildings and 
uh, homes of uh, rich people in North Carolina. Um, so I um, said, we, we must do something. And I thought, well, I'm an educator, and it's important that young people learn about people that um, will inspire them, especially a woman who had so many barriers and came against so many brick walls, but figured out a way to keep going and to overcome them. And I decided that I would write a book for young people so that they could be uh, introduced to her. And I also got involved with the Pauli Murray Center and I decided to retire from teaching so that I could spend my time sharing um, my love for my aunt and other people's interests in her. She followed um, in the footsteps uh, of Martin Luther King's in terms of her philosophy of nonviolence. Um, and she read a lot about Gandhi, that, and he had too. And so she tried to solve problems legally or without uh, violence. Uh, most people don't know that in the 1940s, she was arrested and jailed twice for not giving up her seat in the back of the bus years and years before uh, Rosa Parks. And in 1943 and 1944, um, she organized student protests in Washington, D.C., and uh, desegregated two very large uh, cafeterias. I never knew this. She never boasted. And so I thought in 1959, when I was um, sitting in the seats where I was not allowed to sit in Baltimore, Maryland, when I went to uh, Morgan State College at the time. I thought I was a leader and had no idea that she um, had done that. So I'm very pleased that Reverend Terry invited me here today. I'm just mind blown at the diversity of your program. It's so inspiring. Uh, to have been a part of it and to hear all the various cultural and religious um, readings. And um, I hope that I'll get a chance to talk to the beloved community uh, and some of the students this afternoon in our program. So again, thank you for having me. And um, I hope to see some of you in the future. Thank you, Sister Rosita, for sharing um, your uh, life and testament with us. Uh, we have so few uh, legends who are living, our elders who have actually experienced not being able to go to restaurants and go to the library even uh, to read books, which I remind my kids of often. They should be reading because there was a time when we did not have access to libraries, and so we are pretty familiar with a different world, but it's so few people who have actually experienced uh, those things and who know the people who were involved in the civil rights movement. So I wanted us to get a chance to experience that. And she was so gracious to come um, at this time. So thank you so much for that. And uh, I want us now just to take a minute and think about all of the words that were said, because we all know at this time of the year, we say all these good things and then we forget it tomorrow. But let's just think about what it means to be a beloved community and to really to love and to um, respect each other. Just gonna take a minute, less than a minute, 30 seconds. So before I say the benediction, we're going to sing We Shall Overcome. 
Uh, I'm going to be singing that with a lot of gusto because I think we are overcoming progressively. We've had some steps back, but I do think we are overcoming. And our um, DEI prefects and beloved community ambassadors are going to be uh, walking hand in hand and making a bridge of hope. And Sister Rosita, which I call her Sister Rosita, Miss Rosita Stevens Halsey will walk through that bridge of hope. And then Mr. Packard will be directing everything else from there. Is that correct? Mr. Yes, yes, he's on board. All right, so let us pray now as we go forth. Let us go forth from this place to celebrate and strengthen our inescapable network of mutuality and become the radiant hope needed in the world. Let us go forth confident that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. Please stand for our closing hymn, We Shall Overcome. Thank you. 